welcome to Inform. Welcome to this talk this evening. It is wonderful to see everybody here. Um, this is an exciting evening. I want to thank you for coming very much, and I want to thank my team for putting this on as they make it so so incredibly easy. Everybody's involved, and uh, it's just it is our honest pleasure to have you in our home. And I would like to introduce Steve from the West Coast Modern League to introduce our speakers. Hi everyone, thank you Nancy. Uh, my name is Steve Garens, I'm an architect and chair of the West Coast Modern League. Um, I just want to start by acknowledging how incredible the crowd is tonight. Uh, and we thank you all for joining us this evening. This has been one of our most sought after lectures, uh, and it's not just everyone in this room right now. Um, we had nearly another 100 people on the waiting list um, for this evening, so despite having opened up another 100 spaces. So thank you all. Um, if you know anyone who wasn't able to make it uh, in the end tonight, Please let them know that we'll have a recording of this lecture available online soon after the event. And if you didn't make it to our on-board lecture last April, there was also a recording of that available, and you can find that on our website at westcoastmodern.org. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge that we're gathering today on the unceded traditional ancestral lands of the Coast Salish peoples, the Tsleil-Waututh, the Squamish, and the Musqueam nations, and we are grateful to them for being able to gather with you in this place today. Uh, we wouldn't be able to offer these events in the way that we do without Inform Interiors, so we'd like to offer our sincere gratitude to Nancy, Mel, Spenson, and the whole team here at Inform, not only for your incredible generosity, but for all of the work that you do in uh, helping make these events happen. So thank you so much. As you know, this lecture series is intended to turn focus on our local designers, to those who are caring for the strong history of design that we have here in Vancouver. And it's an opportunity for our community to come together and to share in recent works that are being undertaken right here in our own backyard and to inspire us all as I'm certain we will be tonight. Tonight we welcome Susan and David Scott. Back in 2012, after 12 years of working at prominent Canadian firms, Susan and David broke out on their own launching what has become the award-winning architecture and design practice of Scott & Scott Architects. And they started, as so many of us do, in their home, for them in a street-level studio that they renovated out of a former neighborhood grocery shop and where they continue today. In addition to having built several of their own projects, their studio includes an in-house workshop where they undertake industrial design, prototyping, and material research, work that is foundational to a practice that has been described as, quote, a full investigation of the possibilities of design from building down to the smallest components that make up the environment. Their designs are informed by a deep respect for craft, for local natural materials, and by the process of building, evidenced by their inventive and meticulous detailing, the intimate sensitivity to their surroundings, their conceptual clarity, and the ease with which the materiality of their spaces appears to come together. They have completed and are currently working in varying regions along the West Coast, in the mountains of Colorado and Toronto, in challenging and sensitive geographic situations where environmental factors demand highly considered solutions. Please join me in welcoming Susan and David Scott. here tonight and thank you for the lovely introduction and uh, for inviting us um, the West Coast Modern Link does, uh, does some great work in the community and bringing lectures like this uh, uh, to clearly interested public. Um, uh, we are doing a couple things tonight here that we are not used to doing. Uh, typically, David and I don't like to speak together, um, but uh, we tried it out in Alaska last year and it went pretty well, so, uh, so here we are. Um, we also uh, usually take uh, 
David's old boss, Peter Cardew's advice, and don't speak in our own town. Uh, and uh, I can see now why that is, uh, uh, that was his thought, but um, we'll see how we do. Um, this is us. Uh, typical, we're, typically, we're skeptical of uh, architects who show 10-year-old images of themselves. Um, but uh, this one is from 23 years ago when we first graduated architecture school, so we felt quite comfortable showing that, and it's a bit more, um, it, it shows more about where we come from, and uh, hopefully you'll see how that resonates through uh, our current work. Um, this is us uh, in, uh, it's in a copper mine outside of Kamloops. Um, when we graduated from architecture school in Dalhousie, we moved back home to the West Coast, and uh, it was a recession, and we realized that having um, uh, familiar skills, working skills, might help us get a job uh, as architects. Uh, so we dismantled this building and uh, for David's parents and uh, put it back up again at uh, a lake just outside of Kamloops. That's uh, David's parents' retirement cabin and uh, was finished just about two years ago. <laughs> um, it's, it uses a lot of local materials, a lot of reused materials, and um, yeah, it's a lovely place for us to go with our family. Um, after a very cold November building that in uh, the year 2000, we uh, decided to move down to Vancouver uh, and see if we could actually get jobs as uh, young uh, intern architects. I started working at um, James Chang and uh, David started working at uh, Peter Cardew's office. Um, I then moved to McFarland Green and Bigger and um, after five or six years of working in these offices on very large projects with a lot of documentation, a lot of binders, a lot of uh, um, papers, we were eager to get back to uh, that familiar, kind of more exciting uh, way of building without plans, without all the permits, without all the uh, restrictions. So we uh, found a plot of land on, uh, oh, I didn't skip the slide. Um, we found a plot of land on the north end of Vancouver Island and uh, built this cabin for ourselves. Uh, at the time it was $100,000 and uh, that was 15 years ago, I guess. Um, we built it on uh, weekends, holidays, and uh, with a bunch of friends who helped us out. Um, this, uh, this process introduced us to a lot of the suppliers and uh, um, resource uh, manufacturers on the, uh, on the north coast of Vancouver Island, which we now are still in contact with today. And, uh, and use their marble, their wood, and uh, yeah, I guess that's it. <laughs> yeah, so that's the view from outside our window. It's on a uh, community run uh, ski hill um, north of uh, Campbell River. And within that, uh, we like to build things out of uh, scrap leather uh, that we wrap the handle with and um, uh, stock steel and fasteners to make uh, candle lit uh, candelabra there. Uh, there's no power or water or cell phone coverage, which actually uh, allows us to have a holiday from our practice. Um, there we go. Uh, th this is our home and our studio. It's a uh, block off of Main Street and after working for 10 or so years we um, we realized we really hadn't done a lot of the maintenance that we could have done on this house which we had bought sort of at the very bottom of the real estate listings in Vancouver at the time as well so we um, we quit our jobs. We had two young daughters who were in childcare. We took them out and we decided that we would uh, take on renovating the house uh, with girls at home. And what eventually ended up us starting our practice. 
the studio um, has a big room in the front, which we work in, and uh, it's all lined with Douglas fir, which was supplied by the same mill that provided us with wood for our cabin. And in the back, there's a workshop which we use for uh, prototyping, making models, um, doing different material samples. And we do a lot of kind of assembled things where we're buying components and working with other manufacturers and then um, putting them together. So it's sort of, we do what we can in a small space and we utilize other people's skills, which we don't have. Um, this was one of our, our first commissions. It was a A-frame and Whistler. We had started out with a design for it that used CLT, and it was quite a kind of uh, advanced technological project, which when we finally took it to um, tender, the prices came back extremely high. And to kind of save the project, we redesigned the whole thing and went back to a very simple way of assembling the building with joists and decking in a way that we kind of understood the bare economics of it. The project, um, it utilized certain joinery that we had developed at the time with our engineer that was a very kind of pragmatic set of decisions around how to screw it together using some new fasteners, but in a, a very simple way. And we used a lot of the local materials from the island and the province that we've been used to using. A lot of um, what we kind of learned from that first project, we've put into a lot of the work that we're currently doing. This first project of the four that we'll show tonight is also our first project in the United States, albeit in Point Roberts, so it is sort of just in the United States. But it, uh, being our first American project, we wanted to work um, in a very American way with it, using kind of North American standards. And the essay by Tom Peters, the American Cultural Construction, which talks a lot about the frame and panelized systems in America as being this pragmatic, um, easy type of building which is unencumbered by um, tradition or kind of intellect uh, as the basis, it became sort of how we wanted to start this project. It was also a site that, unlike a lot of sites that we deal with, it doesn't have, it doesn't have a slope, it doesn't have a view, it's sort of a postage stamp at the end of the street. The street is the APA Road, which is named after the Alaska Packers Association Academy that was on Point Roberts. And the site was previously cleared, so it was infilled with alder that had grown over the last 20 years. And the site was sort of one where it really responded well to having a very pragmatic, simple home in the middle. The design was based largely around just the standard uh, gang nail truss as the basis of the dimensions and everything within the, the space. So there, there's a simple truss bay which is extended from end to end of the house in a one and a half story loft. And um, everything is built in a way which is very well suited to sort of a, a, a local builder, but also embracing all the very simple techniques, materials that are available. Um, that kind of approach was very useful because it started being built during COVID. So the availability of a lot of kind of materials that we might use otherwise or things that require shipping or from offshore that are kind of become a daily part of practice weren't available and we weren't using them anyway. So it was actually quite easy to work uh, with the building. The, um, so the trusses which run along the length of the house are fully exposed and expressed and all of the, the, the panel sheeting is finished material where it's not uh, the sheet rock in America, not drywall, so that's something we've learned. <laughs> so everything that's either painted sheet rock or, uh, or plywood and at the two ends of the houses there's clear stories which illuminate the spaces and the natural light filters through the trusses into, on the upper floor, there's um, two little reading desks. This one's for guests. And in the previous photo, there was an area where there's a longer workspace. And the lower floor has um, sort of simple punch, um, punched windows out to views. 
We worked with a supplier in Mexico that made handmade tiles of a kind of standardized dimension for the project. Um, so the, the kind of notion of an American project was really to us a North American project with a lot of the wood product from Canada and these tiles which were in all the washrooms. You can't see it in the photos, but all, all the extent of the ground floor as well. A lot of the um, types of materials we use are sort of consistent from project to project. We often work with uh, the stone off of Vancouver Island, um, West Coast rain, uh, a face for plywood in this situation. Any of the casework was uh, gesso washed so that it was sort of low and tonal difference to the walls where any of the um, the joinery which you touch on a daily basis was made out of solid wood. In this case, the drawer boxes are sort of made in a standard way that emulates the, the boxes that um, the orchards or packing would have. In this case, this is an example of one of the Alaska Packing Association's boxes. The island or any of the kind of joinery which you're using on a daily basis is it all made out of solid material, such as the drawers as well, with the intention that they can age over time and with use um, take on a greater level of durability. There's, uh, in all of our projects, we tend to kind of work with a color and we will mix sort of a custom tint. In this case, it was in sort of ox blood type red, which we can see as synonymous with American kind of design. Um, the outside of the building is clad in uh, last and Douglas fir with sort of a simple galvanized roof. Um, and it was, uh, for us, it was quite exciting to work with things that are very usual North American standards in an expressive way. And when the client took a friend to the house, uh, he came back with the information that they were really excited because it looked very Scandinavian when it was finished. But to us, it was like, it was the quintessential American home that we were building. Since, um, not since that project, but a lot of the projects which we've done utilize kind of prefabricated structural elements. We work with one shop on Vancouver Island quite consistently. This was the Saanich Farmhouse, which we finished about five years ago. It was our first chance to work with them. And they've been um, a great partner with us in kind of developing the wood technique around different kind of types of joinery using the standard lumber, which um, is kind of the basis of the, the first project. <laughs> the second project is a, a project in Whistler where we utilized um, the same builder, but we wanted to make the houses to be, we wanted to use kind of a, a, a setback rule about the area as it was calculated in uh, ADUs in Whistler to make the which is measured to the building, the inside face of the walls, but we wanted the walls to be a usable fixture. So we turned the sub bays that went between the uh, timber bents and made them into um, shelving units. The third project is one which is underway, the same fabricator, but it's at Mount Hood in Oregon, which has a quite extremely high snow load because of the wet snow that they have. And in that case, the same sort of jointing <laughs> techniques were used, but we laminated three plies of um, rough sawn wood with a, an engineered core. Um, and in this case, learning from kind of working with A-frames, we adjusted the, uh, the pitch of the roof to allow for clear stories mid-bay within the A-frame to allow light to fall deep within the space. So we kind of have this working relationship which has been shown in these projects. Um, and it, there's three or four more projects under construction with them, which is happening, where we're using sort of very kind of crude, raw, dimensional lumber, but also utilizing kind of advanced timber engineering with the types of uh, shear rated fasteners and different arrays to achieve the structural requirements of the different locations we're working in. And that's something that allows us to do very simple roof structures from time to time, but also it allows um, for roof structures with a greater degree of complexity. 
Yeah, so this is when it got a little bit more complex. Um, this is the uh, roof structure of a house in, uh, in Deep Cove in North Vancouver. Uh, it's on the water and uh, there's a covenant on the property that limited it to one story. Um, so it, uh, it started out low at the, uh, at the roadside and then uh, increased in height and volume uh, as, it, as it rises towards the ocean. Um, the, almost every single one of those houses is different um, and it, uh, the king post rolls out kind of like a wave uh, towards the ocean as well. Um, the, uh, the foundation was built and uh, these trusses were delivered and uh, thanks to Max who's here in the audience, uh, they pretty much nailed every single connection. Uh, this is a model. We've actually stopped building models uh, since COVID, uh, but we would love to get back into that. But uh, we find it work really well just for everybody to understand exactly what's, uh, what the intention is with the design. So in, in this one, uh, the, the, ocean, the ocean view is key and, uh, and the view across Indian Arm um, is the main focus and, and that structure again allows a, uh, a huge span of the trust to accentuate that view. Uh, this is the original site. The owners have lived on, on the property in a little uh, bungalow for several years. And uh, I don't know how many of you have worked on uh, uh, oceanfront sites, but uh, now because of the rising water level requirements and working with the district of North Vancouver as well as the port authority, um, as well as a geotechnical consultant and a hydrologist, um, there are some significant uh, requirements to actually building uh, in these locations. Um, mainly it's a flood level uh, tank. So the, the house itself is uh, protected from a 100 year uh, sea level rise. Um, and um, so here we have uh, the wall that is uh, creating this tank. Uh, and this particular image on the left is a, is a, a swimming pool that is within the tank um, and also almost at sea level. So uh, that, uh, in order to make it so the house does not appear as if it's a uh, bunker, uh, we also have floodgates uh, within these walls that if the water, if the water rises, it fills into the, uh, the gate and the gate uh, contains the water and keeps keeps the house safe. We'll be testing that before we uh, <laughs> the occupancy. Because there's so much uh, concrete, um, and uh, we wanted to create some visual interest on on that surface. And uh, initially, the builder was quite reluctant, so we built this small box and happened to have another concrete pour that we filled it up with and uh, took it over to him and uh, he was on board and now uh, he's unstoppable with it. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's everywhere. It's, um, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, the image on the left is the, uh, the fireplace hearth where it's uh, being brought into the house and uh, replicated with the uh, radiating uh, metal fins above. Um, there's the, uh, the trusses being delivered. And uh, it was a very nerve-wracking day, but it, uh, it all worked out. And uh, yeah, very, uh, we, we find it interesting when we see images like this. Um, it appears as if the design was uh, mimicking the uh, mountain uh, top across the way, but uh, that was, um, well, I think just good luck. Maybe good design, I don't know. Um, <coughs> So the structure went up and uh, uh, there's that rolling king post I mentioned before. And this view is actually, uh, sometimes these views are not uh, attainable uh, once, they're, once the roof and the rest of the structure is built, but from the front, uh, like the, the front property line, uh, that glazed end, you can actually see this same view uh, running right through the house. And uh, there's the roof uh, covered because it's in deep cove. And uh, yeah, the outside insulation uh, allows us to expose the 
uh, decking uh, on the roof as well. There's the view of the rising trusses and, uh, and the very wide span uh, across the kitchen and the room area. Yeah, and uh, that, those are the sets down to the hot tub that join to the pool. And uh, yeah, it's amazing this house, despite the complexity of the, uh, of the trusses. Uh, there's a, there's a, a real calmness that, that you feel when you enter that. And I don't know if it's the owner or the builder uh, or, or the design, but it just, uh, it just feels comfortable. And that's it from the outside. The concrete's on the bottom. Uh, and then uh, on the top right there, that's actually metal panel and uh, uh, slatted panel as well, similar to what's above the um, uh, fireplace, but they look remarkably similar. That house should be finished in 2020, uh, in this spring. And uh, this is a Ron Tom house. Uh, it's in South Vancouver. Uh, it's the Works Baker house that was originally built in 1952. And uh, when we went to see it, it was during the heat dome of, uh, I guess that was two years ago. Uh, two summers ago, and um, it, it was amazing. It had been lived in by students uh, who really seemed to enjoy the house, but uh, it had definitely fallen into a bit of disrepair. Uh, it was leaking, and uh, um, yeah, it, it needed a lot of love, I guess. Um, it seemed to be that this was one of uh, Ron Tom's 2 a.m. specials that he did while he was working at Thompson, Berwick, and Pratt. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it definitely had some good uh, good features, but um, yeah, it was well worn. And uh, that's the original building permit uh, site plan uh, on the left from 1952. Uh, in 1981, uh, there was a small addition uh, added, uh, so uh, a few more details there. And then here, here we are in uh, 2022, and um, yeah, there's a lot more information uh, required. But as you can see from there, it's a the north is to your left, so it's a very unusual uh, square lot for the city of Vancouver, and uh, it allows for a very wide side yard, um, which actually fits a pool really nicely, and uh, and the uh, the living room, uh, dining room, and kitchen all look out towards that. Um, we also added an accessory building in the back corner um, that, uh, that just closed off the space and created a sort of a private courtyard there on the south side. Uh, when we first started on this job, uh, David uh, went up to Toronto. The, the house on the right is um, actually uh, Peter Cardew's last project for his daughter that we're uh, finishing off uh, with them. Uh, it's an 11 foot townhouse, um, or row house, I guess is the right term for Toronto. Um, and so, well, when he went to stay to have a look at the construction, uh, he stayed at, um, at Massey College in Toronto just to be inspired by Ron Tom so we get the details right. But uh, it's actually available for uh, architects and other, uh, others to, to stay at uh, in downtown Toronto, which was great. I think uh, we, we, uh, we also look back at uh, one of our first projects, um, which was very, um, it, it was an old uh, post and beam house in North Vancouver, and it just required mainly editing. We just took out a lot of material, uh, a lot of finishes, just a lot of stuff. And um, we find with most of these houses, it's, uh, it's good to have a sort of an anchoring element, something that, uh, that will be lasting and, uh, and but potentially uh, uh, avoid any future uh, um, required renovations. So that's where we, uh, we first started using this Vancouver Island marble, uh, just a massive sink um, that shouldn't, uh, well, hopefully we'll stay there forever. So in the Ron Tom house, uh, as it was uh, being dismantled, we, uh, we were thinking of a, of a element of, 
of permanence, but also wanted to keep the elements that were uh, what we thought important to, uh, to the initial design. So that's the fireplace there uh, in the living room, the uh, large openings, and this thin horizontal roof profile. Um, that's the initial plan there, sort of an L-shaped plan, the entrance on the bottom. Is this one? Oh yeah, there's the entry. It's the carport, and just the L-shaped plan with this side facing south, and then an upper floor here with the master bedroom. And then in 1981, uh, this addition uh, took over the carport, and a new bedroom was built here, and uh, a small powder room on the main floor. And then an additional uh, set of stairs was built for another uh, primary bedroom with a bathroom and a walk-through closet. The stairs here were very, uh, once the second uh, renovation was done, were very convoluted. Um, it, it, uh, it, it functionally worked, but um, but didn't connect well to, to the rest of the space. So uh, we removed uh, a lot of that second uh, um, uh, addition um, as part of uh, part of this renovation, and uh, and opened up uh, the upper floor um, on that side for a uh, large primary bedroom. So this is the current plan that's under construction. Uh, we've also enclosed the garage on this side and pulled the uh, pulled the front entry out and uh, created a proper bathroom, useful bathroom with a shower for the city of Vancouver, and, uh, and some stairs down here for a guest room. And, and also this st straight view out here is out to the, the lush garden uh, and has access over this way to the pool. Um, when you come in through the house, you turn to the right to the uh, more public living areas, and, uh, and that's the view out uh, towards the, um, the pool and side yard. Um, we straightened out the stairs so that you come up here to the primary bedroom with an open ensuite and a den and a larger walk-in closet. Those are the two views that I mentioned earlier, straight through the front door, looking out through the um, open tread stairs, and then when you turn right uh, over top of this uh, anchoring element, which we uh, came up with and uh, the owner was uh, very supportive, which was great. Um, that one is a concrete couch, and uh, it's very similar to one of the first restaurants we worked on, uh, Torfuku. The table's still standing, uh, so we replicated the detail uh, in, uh, in this round town house. Um, yeah, there it is being formed. Uh, it's got the supports underneath for 28 days. And, uh, and there it is um, unveiled. It's unfortunate you can't see it now because it's all got uh, protection all over it. And uh, that's just a, a main floor plan showing the outline of the pool and then uh, this accessory building in the back corner. Uh, we, uh, we tied it all together with a, um, a brick uh, surface. Um, and lot to draw on the pool. And then uh, in the spring, the landscape will come in. And uh, yeah, so far, it's it's looking great. The tile setter is amazing. It's got them all in straight lines. And, uh, <laughs> and <it's laughs> uh, there he is. Um, yeah, and uh, I guess the, the windows are uh, and the opening sizes are, are very similar to the original Ron design. Um, and uh, yeah, we're looking forward to seeing this one completed. I think as Susan mentioned, um, site plans in the city of Vancouver can be a very clarifying document um, about some of the things that inform what the design is. In this case, uh, this is a house on the Kitsilano Diversion, so it's a regular width Vancouver lot, but the front and rear angles are um, slightly askew because of uh, 12th Avenue becoming 10th Avenue. Um, the house sits uh, kind of completely within its setback with um, a series of different kind of 
elements within the zoning of that area which kind of inform its shape. Um, it's a zoning document which requires, uh, it sort of in, doesn't necessarily in, require what we did, but the intention is that sort of every floor halves as you go up in height. So you start with a, a proportion of area on the ground floor and then uh, half and then half again for two and a half story house. Um, because this street is an area where there's going to be a lot of change, there'll probably be a lot of apartments along it. The, our client had wanted a house that was sort of a legacy home for their family that could be a forever house, as they called it. So we wanted to take an approach to it that had a kind of robustness about it, which would allow it to kind of exist as a house with the residents around it, but also as a house within a street which was eventually to be kind of mass buildings along its length. And envisioning this kind of street with larger buildings, we also wanted to kind of create um, a little cabin which was within a copse of trees. Uh, growing up in the interior, one of the things that's kind of amazed me about Vancouver are these waxy leafed um, evergreen deciduous trees like rhododendrons and uh, magnolias, which kind of come to life after a dreary, rainy winter um, and explode with color. So our intention was to kind of create this. It's actually a bit of a podium tower, which I think every architect in Vancouver has to work at at some point in their career. So we have made a very small podium tower, but uh, with a little cabin on top of uh, a plant terrace. The little bungalow that was on the site at the start of construction, it wasn't something that we had kind of been intentional about in the initial design, but the opportunity of having this kind of abundance of uh, thin, um, wood of various sizes from the demolition of the house. We saw as kind of an opportunity to use that wood as the formwork for the lower um, robust terrace. The, we had asked the concrete formers to kind of use a, a random array of the wood and um, at the end of the project they brought us this block of wood which they carved into a dice and it was the way that they had determined random, <laughs> which we thought was fantastic. So it, kind of, it lives with the models in our office now. But uh, so different widths of the boards, they would assign a different number from one to six, and then somebody would roll it across the formwork, and then pick the board of that size to go in there. So we kind of we really appreciate that this lower portion of the house. Um, it talks about how it was made, but it also kind of. Uh, quietly references the house that had preceded it on the site. And we, a few of the projects which we're doing in, um, which are renovating kind of mid-century homes have a lot of split plank fencing, and it's something that we encounter a lot on the Gulf Islands. It's something we've noticed is a very durable type of uh, a way of working with the cedar, um, and it's something that we're actually also surprised that there are sort of a few of these small people that are doing this quite often in their farmyards, that they'll go with uh, wedges and mallets and, and split planks, um, mostly for fencing. But in this case, because of the kind of texture of the base and our desire to have the top of the house retreat back behind the plants, we wanted to kind of Treat it in a, in a similar way to how you would treat a fence, that it would just fall into the background and be um, made with a material that had a, a very high degree of kind of character, but also durability and a description of how it was made. For the lower portion of the house where you can approach and enter the front door, um, this is a gouge carved fur uh, was used to kind of create a warm and uh, humanized entry. Um, within the house, the main floor is, uh, um, I guess, I guess on the inside of the concrete portion of the house, the walls are drywall, and they're kind of gallery walls. So this is the east wall of the living room, which is on the north side of the house, where we've got a long kind of gallery going to the back of the house where the family uh, eating area is and the kitchen. And in that corridor, we've put a, a long um, skylight to bring south light in from the living room on the north end of the home. 
Um, you can start to see it, it's a bit shadow in the left or right image. Um, but there's uh, the central core, which is also in this image, is a kind of wooden box which extends up into the wooden um, upper two stories. But the, on the main floor, that box houses a cloakroom and a number of shelves for a ceramics collection. So the house is effectively, um, it seems very small, but it's also four stories. So the basement is the media room, the main floor living and dining with a um, laneway studio. Uh, the second floor are the daughter's bedrooms, which are the same with a study and a family bookcase and washroom. And then the primary bedroom is on the upper floor. The three floors with bedrooms all have um, balconies within the terrace. And the stair, which happens midway through the depth of the house, is quite critical. I mean, combining all the spaces, but it's also um, an important place where light is filtered uh, deeper into the north portion of the home. Um, so this is the stair. Everything within the kind of center of the house is made out of of uh, fur boards of two widths. Uh, one corresponds to the stairs, one is a three inch board which is also the same size as the tiles. The handrail is something, um, along with the handles in the house, something which we've worked in conjunction with the builder. It's sort of a collaborative thing that there are certain parts of it that we will wet mold the leather and hand dye it and uh, form it into handles or into kind of the wrapping for the, um, the handrail, which also conceals a uh, light fixture, which provides light through the home um, in the evening. This is the bookcase leading into this uh, study on the girl's room and a detail of the hand-formed handrail. In this house, because there's an intention about it as a legacy home, there's a lot of kind of hand-based things and things which are working with a lot of the same suppliers, which we work with sort of over and over consistently on projects. Uh, the kind of long-term working relationships with, we have with people have allowed us to kind of work um, in a progressive manner when we're kind of learning from the last version of things to inform the next version. Um, the image on the, the wooden panel has the, hand, the handle which we made in the studio, but it's also all of the cabinetry in the house is made out of um, full width boards. We didn't really want any glued jointry in it. So these doors are constructed in a, uh, a reverse shaker kind of format, which is something that we've seen in kind of informal houses on the Gulf Islands. Um, We've often been told that solid wood isn't stable, and that we shouldn't use uh, hinges on cabinets, but in this case, uh, we've done all of those things. <laughs> um, this is our last slide. The house is almost ready to be moved into. The planting has happened since the photo of the exterior has taken place. And soon the table, um, the table saw in the kitchen will, will be replaced with a table which uh, Inform has been storing for the last six months while the project has been finished. So thank you <laughs> for that and uh, thank you everyone. Any questions? Someone's going to have a question. No questions. It's so perfect. Mmm. <laughs> okay. Nice one. Okay. Oh, here. Okay, we're starting. first for like such a great talk and I've been watching this house go up for a long time and just appreciating all the details. I spent a lot of time on the Gulf Islands and have been kind of wondering where different details of inspiration have come from and it's cool to see the links back up to that and our own histories in it. 
Um, but I'm also curious about the planting. That's more where I come from the planting side a bit more. And I'm curious about how your ideas or visions of the planting inform some of the architectural decisions that you made as far as supporting those magnolias on, I think, the plinth and uh, a few of the other kind of, yeah, planting visions that you had and how that related to the design of the house itself. Yeah, I, I think um, in some ways there's a lot of plants that I, I associate with sort of uh, like granny gardens. So like um, the yards that I really appreciate in the city where you have very mature uh, floral things that are kind of a little bit off. So the intention was to really work with a lot of um, those there's sort of ubiquitous ways of having gardens in the city and combining them all into this site so that for two to three weeks in the spring, it just explodes with color. And then it goes back to just being a quiet copse of trees. And that's something that I really love about Vancouver is this explosion of, and abundance of color that just happens and then it disappears. So that was um, a big part of it. Uh, working with the landscaper, it was, uh, it was actually quite funny because we would go to place the trees and I would keep saying move it into the middle and they'd say most architects tell me to move the trees away so you can see the building and we were <laughs> kept pushing for more and more trees. They all seem too small to me at this point as well but I do appreciate uh, that time is a big part of a garden's life. So we, we can we like the idea of seeing this house change year after year as the, the evergreen magnolias and rhododendrons start to mature and fill out and take shape, but also as the house retreats into the background sort of with the intention that that architecture is something that you really don't perceive necessarily in this house. It's more about um, the flowering plants. It's a kind of also an approach that we see a lot of houses where you just build a big hedge around it to kind of create privacy, but in this case we wanted a form of privacy which was also an offering to the city, so it had a, a moment of beauty every year where it just explodes with colour. Any other questions? I have a question. I'm here. Um, okay, I've got, sorry, I'm here. I'll <laughs> That's a very nice presentation, thank you. Um, who are the engineers you work with and how do you collaborate with them? Sure. We work with uh, Wiki Hearst neighbor and uh, mainly Dan Wiki there. As a, uh, we've been working with him for a long time and uh, we find he's very um, uh, creative when, uh, when we ask him to do something. Uh, maybe he's slightly reluctant to do initially. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and he's got a great team of engineers who, who work with him as well. Uh, we, we do have a couple jobs in uh, Colorado and Toronto, and we're working with different engineers locally there. But uh, yeah, we're open to anyone. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, just wondering, you said you stopped physical modeling. I'm wondering what you replace that with and if it's been as successful or if it's just different. We've unfortunately replaced it with Zoom. Uh, <laughs> it's a, a lot of, I think about half of our work is in the United States as well now. So a lot of our meetings are virtual and the physical models don't kind of allow for the same. Um, it's also the sort of collaboration that happens um, with the models in 3D with engineers that are not in the city as well. So I don't think we're full stop stopped, but uh, for now, it's just been, a, over the last few years, it's really been replaced with computer modeling. So digital 3D kind of walkthroughs, five mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Okay. Thanks. That opens up too many possibilities though, so we, we would like to get back to the, uh, the, three, uh, the physical models. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, um, thanks for the talk. I'm incredibly inspired by your work. And I'm really curious to hear about your design process, especially as a, a team, and how you, if you collaborate on projects, if you each have your own, and how you kind of keep, you put your 
projects are very diverse and yet there's a real signature aesthetic to them. And so I'm just curious to hear how you work as a couple. Yeah, I guess it's uh, constantly changing. But uh, I think initially we work uh, doing some kind of uh, initial scheme, going back and forth and have a few, uh, I guess even, even once a client comes, we, we each on our own uh, create an idea and, uh, of, of what we're thinking and then eventually it, it organically merges together. I don't know, but uh, it, I don't think we, have a, we don't have a plan or a consistent way, way of doing that. And then with our, uh, Great team in our office. I think they're all here tonight. There's six of them, and we we go back and forth, uh, and, uh, and 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 then with the owners themselves, it's an amazing. What I I I don't always like change, but when we uh, look back at the initial project that we presented and then see what the final is, I I, I find it incredible, and the amount of change that happens during that process, and the amount of. Um, uh, I don't know, it, tightness or loo looseness that is just, uh, it, um, it, it seems to take on its own. I'm not sure. If you, if you have a different strategy, I'd like to hear it as well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, like, Susan and I had, we, we met in school uh, 26 or 7 years ago, and it was a school where there was a lot of making happening. Um, there's a guy named Darcy who's back there who uh, did very beautiful models and was back and forth to Kamlich working in a house for his parents. Um, Todd and Stephanie who have started MOLO, they were in the school and there was this real kind of relationship between how things were made and almost a kind of pragmatic approach to architecture. And going and building uh, my parents' cabin and getting jobs, we really became site architects quickly in our career. And a lot of our understanding of design was really directly related to construction. So a lot of it was about the refinement that happens and the decisions that happen both um, um, unexpectedly or in ways you don't want to happen, but actually kind of bring those things back in um, to making the design better through kind of integrating the things that occur on site. And I think over the years we've worked that way, basically. It's, it's a very pragmatic approach where we're kind of thinking about it as construction quickly in the process and then looking through the process of construction about how to refine it and how to seize opportunities that are pres present in each one to make each project um, its own special project. Yeah, I think that's a good I'd like to thank you for your uh, adventures in developing uh, materials and detailing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's a great way to end, don't you think? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so very much. Thank you, West Coast Modern League. Everybody. <laughs>